just for the record, uh, we're not talking here about anxiety and guilt. Anxiety and guilt are kind of left. We're talking about affects which are have signatures in the autonomic nervous system which trigger an HPA response, which trigger cortisol, et cetera, et cetera, heart rate, et cetera. We're talking about the following effects. We're talking, and I said this earlier before, hopeless despair, um, rage states, shame, disgust, um, uh, and, and positive emotions, positive emotions. Let me go back. Uh, what part of the problem with early relational trauma is not only there's abuse and neglect, but there is a paucity of any play in relational trauma between the mother and the infant. So this baby does not know how to play, and it's out of play comes joy and excitement, etc. And therefore, positive emotions are very foreign to these individuals. Um, they don't know what to do with them, how to recognize them, what meaning to make of them, uncomfortable in the body with them, etc. So a positive emotions also would be a critical pieces here to boot. But ultimately, in my work, in, in my understanding, I think that the most difficult affects to hold on to in the countertransference are hopelessness and helplessness. You know, there's an easy, well, you can do this or that and the other thing, but, uh, but that's been this person's life. This person's life has been into severe dysregulation, and then you get a freeze response, right? You get a freeze response, and they're blocked literally, uh, because essentially what you have here is no access to any active coping strategies. It's all passive coping. It's moving deeper and deeper within. Ultimately, one moves too deeply within, so to speak. You, you know, under stress, you can get a collapse of the inner world, and then we're looking at, uh, again, a suicidal crisis. Um, one other piece on that. Uh, it's been said, and I agree with this, that uh, essentially, because the right is setting up so poorly, what you have here is this individual is attempting to live his life in the, or her life in the left hemisphere. And so everything is rational and logical and analytic. Even the plan to kill is rational and analytic and logical, etc. But the left hemisphere only has so much capacity for regulating affects. And ultimately, when that you know, breaks down and the right breaks down, so to speak, then we're looking at these, these crises. Um, but yes, the affect tolerance is a key there. This also means that the person is very sensitive to the communications that are coming from the therapist. Now, the communications that were coming to the baby in these moments of neglect and abuse were processed by the baby. Why? Because the state changed in the caregiver as she began to get into the dysregulated state, as she was about to massively abandon the child and pull away interactive regulation or intrude into the child into hyperarousal. And so you have a system here whereby these individuals are exquisitely sensitive to nonverbal communications of either abandonment, you know, which would be neglect and disengagement, or hyper-engagement, etc. That means in the transference, kind of transference, where these communications are going back and forth between the therapist and the patient through the right brain mechanisms, not words, but nonverbal communications, facial expression, tone of voice, prosody, these are processed exquisitely by the patient, so to speak, sub, at a subcortical level. And again, what this means is that if there is a, a lack of awareness, so to speak, of how one's own subjectivity is being communicated to the other side of the intersubjective field, this can really be problematic here. And what you have is that very small misattunements, which can be looking away at the wrong period of time, can trigger a shame response, and now we're going into a spiral, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, I would suggest to you that uh, this knowledge, this new information about nonverbal communications also is critical for this kind of work.